Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay, you beautiful too. painting right behind you, by the way. Oh, thanks. I painted it myself. It's gorgeous. All the colors and everything. It's absolutely beautiful. Thanks. It's, um, I paint a lot. That's one of the things that I do. You're an abstract artist then? Yes, abstract. My um, son likes abstract art. Oh, really? Yeah. Does he paint? No, Ross. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I'll share some of that work with you. <laughs> that would um, be lovely. Yeah, I want to go ahead and we'll start with uh, the podcast. Right. And I assume I'm under friendly fire anyway, so. <laughs> yes, this is friendly fire. <laughs> so welcome to God and Matter. I'm Arlene J.M. Grant, your host. And today my guest is Rabbi Sonia Starr, and she is with the Columbia Jewish Congregation. She's an awesome rabbi, and I'm glad to attend her congregation. Rabbi Starr, I've said who you are in a general way, but who do you say you are? It's a wonderful question, and I sometimes think it depends on the day. And even within that day, it might depend on the hour or the minute that I'm asked. There are times that, you know, I was on a professional call earlier. And so at that moment, I thought I was doing political activist work. And then all of a sudden, the middle, middle of the call, because my son's working remotely, he's doing school remotely now because of COVID-19, I had to say, excuse me for a second, I have to be mom and get him back on <laughs> task, right? So that who I am changes, right? I am a religious person. I am a clergy person. I am a woman. I'm a feminist. I'm married to another woman. I have children. I'm a sibling. I'm a daughter. There's a lot of things that exist as part of my identity. And I think when I was younger, I thought that my identity had to be defined by only one. As I get older, it seems to me that the multiple aspects really fill out the one. Okay. So with these multiple aspects about who you are, how did you decide to become a rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> so how I became a rabbi is one of those questions people always ask, and I always wish I had a better answer. Um, I was actually in a PhD program. I was studying Bible in the ancient Near East. I ended up leaving that program with a master's um, in Bible and Ancient Near East. But I realized in the process of that program that I loved learning. And I loved the, I, I, if I was to be reborn, it would be during the Second Temple period, without question, if I had a choice. But in the meantime, I really missed working with people. I missed having interactions with I wanted to spend more time than just teaching or in the library, which is what an academic really does. And the only other place that I knew that I could actually do more and still continue studying the Bible was as a rabbi. But to be honest, I wasn't committed to being a rabbi. I was committed to the learning. So I went for one year. I said I would go for one year. I didn't tell them that. But I said I would go for one year and see how it would work out. And once I got there, it was the best thing I ever did. And I never turned back. It was the path. There have been times in my life where it feels like the universe or God is guiding my path. And that felt like one of them. I was where I needed to be. That's beautiful. Now, why the second temple? Why then? Why was <laughs> second temple period from what I've studied, and I'm not an expert, but what I've learned was explosive. In both positive, every positive and negative ways that that word means, there was all in, and explosive within the Jewish world, not just the external world. The Jewish world had early Christians were Jewish, right? It had the Jews who were starting synagogue life. It had the Jews that were dedicated to the temple life. It had the Dead Sea Scroll, the Essenes. It had such a flourishing of activities. From what we could tell, women were much more powerful in the second temple, they could own property, they did business interactions, they could study, they were called prophets, they could preach, they had home synagogues, they were um, officials with their names on the walls of external synagogues. It just seems like an incredibly dynamic, alive, breathing error that just fascinates me. Um, so that's why. It is fascinating. Now, the second temple was destroyed. It and was. Why was it destroyed? Well, according to who? <laughs> <laughs> so so people say, well, what happened to it? I mean, why did that end? It was a great time that you're describing, but why did it end? So, I mean, historically it ended because 
the Jews didn't do what they needed to do to satisfy the Roman the Roman leaders, right? So they were killed, right? That's how Rome worked. I'm not going to, I didn't mean to make it sound like utopia. They also had to pay homage to Rome. They were under Rome's supervision. The rabbi said that um, it was destroyed because Jews did not get along and that Jews used um, Lishon Hara uh, gossip in a negative way to hurt each other and destroyed the, destroyed the community. And therefore that destroyed the second temple. You know, I, I don't I don't know why. I might wish I could go back in time, but that doesn't mean I'm old enough to have lived then. So I'm not sure I know why it was destroyed. And I'm not even sure. I wish it wasn't destroyed the way it was. I don't think any, you know, I don't glorify oppressors destroying religious sanctuaries of their oppressed people or even oppression. But I think that there was going to come a time, based on what I've read, that the Second Temple was going to outlive its usefulness. And so it was probably going to end sometime in the next hundred X number of years anyways, um, which is why Judaism in the form of synagogue life took over and expanded, but nobody wanted to end the way it did. Right, right. It's interesting when you talk about it, like there's all the positivity and then there's the negative elements. But you said something really crucial is that destruction ultimately came because the people didn't have love. Yeah, the rabbis didn't actually say love. I mean, I understand why you extrapolated that. I guess I'm calling it, if you're gossiping, you're not helping each other, there's a lack of love. And I think that that lack of love led to destruction. I think love is a really interesting word in our society today. I don't, I'm not anti-love, don't get me wrong. I love being loved. I love loving people. That's, I don't have a problem with that. I think that the rabbis might have said a lack of community, a lack of respect. I don't know if they would have said a lack of love. And I don't know in our contemporary world, if I'm always advocating for, shooting for, trying to create love. If love comes that's icing on the cake. That's a bonus. But foundationally, I don't know if it's love always. I think that the, you, you need to start with respect. You need to start with justice, equality. You need to start with certain other things that might exist without love, right? But then might lead to love. So, and I might be wordsmithing. I don't mean to do that, but that's just, you know, I've been watching all these commercials as we all are in COVID-19 state, right? Yes. And they keep having all these mini commercials. I love you. We love you, right? Well, these people don't know me. They bump into me and knock me over, right? They don't have a clue anything about why I exist, what I am, what I do in the world. They don't love me. You can't love someone you don't know, right? So I think we utilize that world, word very freely today, and I'm not sure that's always helpful to us. You make a very good point, because love is often misunderstood. When I talk about love, I speak of it in the context of the Torah, in an agape type of love that we have, that is a respect, that is a justice. I mean, when it talks about as God being love, um, that there is this, this perfection, I think, of love within us that causes us to vibrate love. Mm -hmm. And as a natural offshoot of that, that love will look like respect. It will look like community. It will look like justice and true justice. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think you know my background. I'm a lawyer turned artist. So I say justice, and I used to say to the judge I clerked for, justice is manufactured in many instances. But the justice that we might see in the court or in a neighborhood gathering is not necessarily divine justice. Mm -hmm. And so that divine justice to me is love. And when we allow that love to flow through us, that's the love that I'm getting or getting right, to. Right. I think that's what they needed that they missed and resulted in the temple falling. I, no. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I apologize. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, it might be helpful to actually, in some ways, go back to the biblical definition of love, which I think will support what you just said. Because the Bible, you know, it says, you shall love the Lord your God. It didn't care if you felt love, right? The Bible, I mean, obviously they had feelings back then. We have no reason to assume they didn't, but they didn't care if you felt love. They cared if you acted as if you 
love someone, right? So it wasn't a feeling, it was an action. And that's really what you're describing is that action. And in that sense, I agree with you. Yeah, I feel like love is a verb. I think mm -hmm. love is action. Love produces action. And it's interesting that you say that about feelings because infatuation is often the love that we think about, that romanticized notion of love. But love is much more than that. And so I think that we, we see that similarly. Now, with you being who you are, what motivates you to be? I had asked you to send me a couple questions, which you were kind enough to do, which I really appreciated because it gets me thinking. It gets me to, to have an idea of what you're looking for. Of all the questions you sent me, that one was the hardest question <laughs> for me to answer. <laughs> um, and so I even went to my partner and said, okay, if you were to answer, what am I to be? What, 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 what is the answer to that question? I am a very action-oriented doing person, right? I do. Even in my free time, I'm happiest when I could do. I'm happy when I can pick what I want to do, but I like to do things. I don't just sit quietly. Prayer life took a while for me to become part of me. It wasn't, it's not my personality. It wasn't what I took to initially. Um, I, it grew on me and grew in me. That's, um, That's really but, good. Thank you. But, mm -hmm. but what I discovered in that process is that being, just being, for me at least, meant how do I, how do I live as centered, connected to the sacred as I humanly can in this moment right this second? So the tools I use to help me is prayer. The tools I use to help me for sure is Shabbat, and I took to Shabbat right away. The holidays, eventually Kashrut, that took time, right? But those are all tools that anchor me, center me, connect me to God and community and other people, and allow my essence to be. That's the best way that I can answer that question. That's an honest way to answer the question, and that's appreciated. So when you talk about prayer, because a lot of people are searching right now, and a lot of people don't understand what prayer is. So it's very important to get your perspective on or how you were able to master prayer. I would suggest um, it's a process that I'm in the, God willing, the middle of, not a done deal. <laughs> it's not a, I haven't mastered anything yet. Um, if I have an active prayer life, it won't be mastered until my life's over, right? That's okay. the journey of my life. But for me, one of the stumbling blocks was the words. Now, I pray in, in Hebrew, but I didn't. I came from a very strong Jewish family, but not a traditional Jewish family. So I, didn't, I knew how to read, decode Hebrew, but I didn't know how to translate. I didn't know what the words meant. And we went to the synagogue on holidays, but we didn't go on Shabbat. We didn't go every week, right? It wasn't an ongoing thing. For me, the words were really, and the tunes, because I can't sing. You know I'm a rabbi and not a cantor for a reason. But <laughs> the, the tunes, the words, the process of it was a stumbling block. Like until I got out of the headset that if I said a word wrong, if I sang it wrong, if I turned to the wrong page, if I did the wrong prayer in the wrong order, until I got out of that kind of, oh no, the world's going to end because I did it wrong, that was important for me. That was an important stumbling block to get over. Once I got over that, as I learned more Hebrew, right, the Hebrew then became a stumbling block because I don't necessarily believe every single thing every single prayer says, right? So how do I get past that stumbling block? At some point through that whole video, very long process, it became clear to me that I'm really having a conversation. And the conversation might externally to everybody who looks at me look the same week by week or day by day, but internally is very dynamic and different. And so that conversation, that's my internal work. Sometimes it feels like that conversation is just between me and God. I haven't always used the God word, but, but I do more and more now. Sometimes it's felt like that conversation was between me and my community. Sometimes I felt like that conversation was between me and me. <laughs> I needed to listen to me like nobody else needed to. But once I got into the place that I saw prayer as a conversation, then all of the external guides, the, the prayer book, the songs, the community, the melody, they were my guideposts. They were my guides. They enhanced it, but they didn't define it. And that led me into a conversation, I don't know how to say it, a conversation that has sustained me in the most difficult as well as in the happiest of times. I, I agree with that. I think prayer is a conversation. 
And sometimes it is a conversation with yourself, you know, and then it's, it's going on a broader spectrum. I believe that the rules, if there's actually something I read, God is not moved by our perfection of words that are spoken, but by the unspoken words, which is our heart. Right. Right. You know? so, so that's a beautiful thing. And so for those who are probably curious about how to build a prayer life, it's not coming with this absolute perfection or being able to say things from rote memory. That's everything I said and agree with and believe. And just because I believe in the yin yang of life, the balance of life, there also is a person, when, when I'm going out into the community, people ask me about spirituality, like, why do you need a prayer book? You know, Jews will ask me, right? Why use a prayer book, right? It's a foreign language. Even if we did it all in English, it's not the style we like. Why can't we just pray, right? Spontaneous prayer. Why can't I just do that? And absolutely, everybody can and should do spontaneous prayer, right? The, the Kabbalists, the mystics said we should say 100 blessings a day. Well, when they started saying 100 blessings a day, they weren't defined which ones or how to say them or what kind of formulation. They were, I'm supposed to wake up and what's, what do I see? What am I grateful for? What is catching my attention in this, in this moment, right? But if we only pray in that spiritual spontaneous kind of way we never get beyond speaking me to me or me to god the only way to extend that conversation to be from me to the community me to other people is that if i enter into then liturgy and so it's trying to find that balance between the established communal liturgy and that individual spontaneous prayer great that's important i would agree with that I don't know if I, I think I shared that with you before, but I don't know if I shared it with people who've been listening to this podcast or when it starts to air for them, that I actually went to seminary. So there was a time when I was in seminary where things were not lining up and things were becoming confusing. The people were becoming confusing. And I remember saying, God, I can't believe you're going to unleash these people on your children. And I had to put the Bible down for a moment to reconnect with the God that I believe sent me into the seminary to, to make sure that it aligned. So the books are important and the relationship is also important. Does that uh -huh. make sense? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, it does. The rabbis also said there was a third part to that. The, the, the book, the, the relationship with God, but they also said you need a teacher, a mentor. And our, in our contemporary language, we might say a spiritual guide, right? Then nobody can discover everything they need to do on their own, right? And I know seminary was important, but I also know since then you've had many different spiritual teachers in your life as I have been blessed to have many different ones in my life. So I often ask people who are trying to figure out how to even start with the prayer life to find a teacher, whether it's a virtual teacher, a teacher they can actually talk to a real teacher, a teacher, a professional teacher, or a teacher that's just a friend teacher, somebody that can help be a sounding board, a guide, because I think we hear things differently when other people reflect back what we've been saying, and it helps us develop also. A very important point. Uh, they actually, the other day I was doing some study, and I was learning that Torah, the word Torah, is often misunderstood to be law when it's actually teaching. Correct. And the rabbis are teachers. Mm -hmm. So there was always that, and whatever you believe, there's always a teacher who conveys information and knowledge. Absolutely, I agree. That's powerful. Now, you are more than involved in the community as a rabbi. You also work with something that's important to me. I'm the daughter of immigrants, first generation, before we became involved, as Columbia Jewish Congregation became involved with the current immigration status, we created what we call a tikkun olam platform, um, which is a social action platform. We created a process by which the congregation could take a position on different issues. And throughout the years, we've taken different issues. The most recent one is the one around immigration that you're aware of, but there have been others along the way. And I would argue the tikkun olam work I do is not outside my rabbinate, right? It's part of my rabbinate, that it is not enough to pray or just work with inside my community. That should motivate us to make the world a better place. 
And so that's part of what I did. In 2017, when um, immigrants in the United States became under attack by our administration, by our government, we started to get more and more involved with the issue of immigration and especially undocumented immigrants as well as asylum seekers, really from the position of learning about Jewish history, right? Not all Jews came fleeing persecution, but by far the far majority of American Jews did. My own family, two of my, all four of my grandparents came to the United States. Two of my grandparents broke the law to get here and two of them came legally, right? And there are countless stories of Jews being snuck in trunks, snuck across borders, paying people off to get into this country, buying other people's visa to get, right? We, we did what you needed to do to get safe, just like the immigrants are doing today, what they need to do to be in a safe place. And I don't understand why anybody would think that trying to find a healthy, safe place to live and create and raise a family would become illegal. I just don't understand that jump. And so in 2017, we started exploring different ways we could become more involved with immigration issues. Part of that, we started meeting other people who were working in our county locally, think globally, act locally, who were working on immigration issues. And then this past summer, we were one of the founding founding members of the Howard County Coalition for Immigrant Justice. And since then, we've been working very hard about, at first, two issues, but we've really narrowed it down to one because we want to succeed, and then we can move back to the other. But that issue is Howard County is one of the few detention centers now in Maryland that actually has a contract with ICE. And why anybody in the United States at this point would be doing the work of ICE is immoral, it's unethical. And so the work we've been doing with the Howard County Coalition for Immigrant Justice is to get Howard County to end the contract with ICE. How has that been advancing, that effort? And you're right, it is important to include the congregation. They forget about the social justice element. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky at CJC, they've let me do that. Not every congregation would have, but that's also part of why I came to CJC, right? It was part of what I was seeking. It's been a mixed bag, I won't lie. The coalition itself has been wonderful. We are growing, we are getting new members. Even with COVID-19, we are reaching new congregations, new organizations. We're not all congregations, some of us are secular. New organizations that wanna join us, that believe in what we're doing. So it is growing, it's getting bigger. This frustrating part, the really difficult part, is that our executive, a county executive who could have ended the contract all by himself, has refused to. And in fact, he's made it increasingly more and more um, clear, even with COVID-19 being in the detention center, even with Governor Hogan allowing people who are nonviolent offenders to be freed, even with Frederick free ending, freeing all of their detainees um, from ICE, he will not do any of that. And so we have actually started to shift our focus from him to working on our county council members, who have a right to create a bill and send it to him. And we're really hoping they set up and do the job that he is refusing to do himself. That's great that you have a workaround. Very, very important to do that. Is there any indication in terms of why he won't? So in some ways I want to answer, and not to be catty, but I want to answer, you should ask him, right? It's not <laughs> well, I mean, has he espoused any viewpoint in terms of defending his decision? In his mind, they are criminals. They are broken the law. They, they're in a prison because they deserve to be in a prison. Um, and it's not his job to take on ICE nationally. That's the other piece of his message. But I encourage people to ask him. It's interesting. He's a county executive, correct? Mm -hmm. So isn't he supposed to serve at the will of the people? And we have reminded him that we, we will be voting again, paying attention to this issue. Good. Very good. And it's also very unfortunate. What kind of problems do we need to resolve right now with the immigrants being detained? I know that COVID-19 coronavirus is one major issue. One of the things that um, we need to pay attention to is that detention is not the only means there is of, of rectifying our broken immigration system, right? We have a big immigration problem. That's a federal issue and it's broken. And many of the people who are here right now undocumented came in legally. And if we had a functioning immigration system, 
they got them to court and justices and lawyers in a affordable, timely manner, they would not be undocumented. In fact, the far majority of them. So there's some responsibility we as American citizens need to take that our system is broken and that's not their fault, right? But the other piece of that is that we have to get the conception in our head that the only way that we can get somebody who's undocumented to see a judge is by putting them in a detention center. The first place, the majority of undocumented people before 2017 went to their court hearings, showed up when they were supposed to, to renew their visas, right? It was only when they were afraid of being round up that they stopped going. If we put in place that safety, they would be more compliant and willing to help. The other thing is that there are other ways that we can keep track of people who are nonviolent, but not always remembering to get to their court date or don't speak English or read English or have had to move around because they don't have a stable home or finances so they don't always get their mail in a timely manner, like ankle bracelets, like all kinds of other ways of enforcing the law that does not require them to give up their jobs, lose contact with their family, and be taken out of community. And we should be emphasizing those, those aspects. Nobody wants violent offenders out on the streets. If somebody's a rapist, if somebody's a gang member, if somebody's a murderer, they should be in jail. But they should be in jail for those crimes, not because they're undocumented. You brought up something that I had not considered, that many of these people came legally and then Correct. became illegal in the country. Right. If you think about it, first place, there is no way to go through the immigration process without a lawyer. I mean, no way. Everybody, and they're not even immigration lawyers, like other lawyers say there's no way. And in fact, at one point we were working with an organization and we were asking, we have a lot of lawyers at CJC. We actually don't have any immigration lawyers right now, but we have a lot of lawyers. We were asking those lawyers to volunteer pro bono time to help with immigration. And they said it'd be unprofessional because you need somebody who knows immigration law. It's such a specialty, right? So now you have not only law, but an immigrant law, which is extremely expensive, right? And a system that has, uh, I don't remember the numbers, so people will have to forgive me, but I want to say three to five years, but somebody should Google that. Dr. Google will give you the real answer. Backlog, three to five, something like that, backlog. Well, if you have a backlog that long, that means you need a lawyer for three to five to 10 years before you can even get citizenship. Uh, that's not a fair expectation. And most of our ancestors, any of our ancestors, would have failed at that expectation. Very true. Very true. Um, for lawyers who might be hearing this, the American Bar Association does create programming to help you help others with the situation. But, you know, things change, so always check resources and look at Dr. Google and your different states. If anybody is listening who's in Maryland in our vicinity, who is a lawyer or a legal aide who has um, either has that expertise in um, immigration law or willing to get it and knows how to get it and has pro bono hours to give, we know people who could use them. That's good to know. Thank you. What do you think people can do? help what what is say i'm not a lawyer i'm just somebody who has a heart and a brain and what you're saying is registering to me some of it, some is, of it is graphic and some of it is any of us right anywhere so if you happen to be in howard county let me know let me know you know google me you could find me rabbi star at columbiajewish.org send me an email i will put you in touch with the coalition we have a growing number of individuals as well as groups and we can really use your help if you're in the state of maryland casa de maryland um for casa de maryland jews united for justice or organization aclu are three organizations that are really taking this on in a very strong powerful coalition we're working together kind of way Get in touch with them. They can tell you what the next steps are wherever you live and or within our state. If you're outside of the state of Maryland, do some research. You know, I can't tell you every single state. Each one is so specific, but do some research. What are the organizations that are working on immigrant um, issues? Look up the, the big national ones, CASA, ACLU, 
see where they stand um, on this issue and how you, they all need volunteers. They need people to write letters. They need people to make phone calls. They need people to sign petitions. They need people to hold both virtual and real meetings to talk to people, to convince their friends to do education. There's a lot we can do and need to be doing. There's also a more, um, those are all legislative things. Those are all um, social action measures. There also are more um, benevolent care kind of ways that people can get involved. We have a member of our congregation who sponsored, who actually got asylum status, but they aren't allowed to work and they needed a sponsor to live in this country. And so they sponsored a stranger that they never met um, before and her son and have been living with the congregation and our congregation, as well as a few other congregations, have been helping them do that, providing free doctors, providing clothes, providing toys, babysitting, English lessons, all of that kind of resources. There are many different organizations like that. Right now, nobody's bringing anybody in because of COVID-19. Eventually, God willing, we'll be in a place where we can start bringing people in again. Think about opening your home. Do the research now to figure out if you can when the time is right. Find people who are sponsoring other people who are shut in now because of COVID and see if they need help. How can you help them? How can you support them? We all need to be in this together to get through this together. Very true. You talked about the uh, teaching of language skills. My dad used to teach English as a second language to immigrants as part of his way to give back. And so I encourage people to look at other ways. And maybe, you know, it's going to be some time for congregations, whatever faith, whatever walk of life has opportunities. You could do a Zoom class for mm -hmm. people and invite people you know, for 30 minutes and teach English or do something to connect. There are many little things that can be done. And, and there might be economic ways you can help. So for example, the person that I was talking about, we didn't know this until she got here, was a seamstress. And she makes beautiful things. Well, since COVID-19, she started making face masks. And so she can't work, which means she can't sell them. So she's giving them away. People can make donations to her legal fund. That's a choice they make, but people are making whatever donation they feel they can afford. But she's making face masks, and we are advertising them so that people, A, get face masks that they need, and B, then hopefully they will donate to her legal funds and help her. So there are all kinds of ways that people come with skills that we should really be embracing and, and lifting up so that they get the support they need as well. And they can feel like they're contributing. They're part of our world. That's true. You can donate you know, and, and help. And she is providing a service. And that's a very important service that we all need right now. Right. So your website, just so you can say it so that people can know where you're advertising it. Columbia Jewish Congregation. It's our name. If you Google Columbia Jewish Congregation in Columbia, Maryland, you'll find us. We're the only ones here. Right. I could have said it, but I wanted you. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I found you through Dr. <laughs> Google. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things, and I thank you for the information that you provided. Is there an inspirational message, a poem, scripture, something that you want to share with people to inspire them? So when you asked me of that, I, I, there were so many that I could think of. It was not an easy find, <laughs> only not because to narrow it down to one <laughs> is not so easy. But what struck me um, was two, two different verses in two different places in the same chapter of the book of Pirkei Avot. And Pirkei Avot is, is the words of our sages, and it's a book of the Mishnah. And the one that we're supposed to be reading at this time as we count the Omer, as we connect Passover to Shavuot, many of us study Pirkei Avot. And these two verses appear in the first um, chapter of Pirkei Avod, and they seem to say different things. They both agree on the first part. The world stands upon three things. They both start that way, and they both agree with that. But it's the three things that they disagree on. Um, Shimon the Righteous said, it, we, the world stands on Torah, um, Avodah, which is another form for either sacrifice, animal sacrifice, or prayer and worship, or Gimilu Chasadim, acts of loving kindness. But Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, no, the world does stand on three things, but the three things are justice, truth, and peace. 
I like these two verses, and I like the fact that they say two different things, and I love the way the rabbis found to bring them together as one. And the rabbi said, why do we have these two different interpretations? And the answer was that we need Torah study to determine what is just, as you put, divine justice. And our prayers will lead us to what that truth is. And if we're lucky, our actions will bring us to wholeness and peace to everyone who lives on our planet. I had to sit with that for a moment. That was really powerful. And as you were talking and I thought about something, it, you know, it talks often in the Torah or the Bible, whatever people want to call scriptures, that there's a sacrifice that's made. Prayer. Yeah, is, I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. Prayer took the place of animal sacrifices. Historically, right? When the temple was destroyed, you couldn't do animal prayers, animal sacrifices anymore. So you did prayers. But prayers existed before the second temple was destroyed. And some of our oldest, oldest prayers were said in the second temple, for sure. But both of them are attempts to create that conversation we were talking about earlier, just in different forms. And none of them were to create that conversation as if the conversation was the end, but rather that conversation was then created, that, that link was created so that all of the other things that we want in life, need in life to to create a just, peaceful world can also take place for everybody, not just me. It's not enough just for me. It's for the whole world. It's for all of us. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. And I appreciate that. Now, for those who are interested in finding a creator or a source, they need to make some meaning out of this life and connect. What would you suggest that they do? One of the stumbling blocks Again, it comes back to that same thing I said before in prayer. That's interesting. That's a self-reflection on myself I'll have to think about. But one of those stumbling blocks has to do with language. Don't get so caught up on what, what, uh, what that, that end thing is, right? Whether it's God, a creator, a, a source, the name. Try to think about it as in what gives life meaning? What gives it meaning more than just me? Like it's not just what gives Sonia meaning right? But what gives life meaning to us? To place us instead of me in that sentence? What connects us? You know, COVID-19, I think, other than being absolutely terrifying and horrific by every stretch of the imagination, don't get me wrong, is also an opportunity. It's a challenge to us. And one of the many challenges it is to us is to understand that I might not know anything about what goes on in China, but what happens in China clearly affects me here right? And I might have no idea how germs are transferred from one person to the X and ha another and how it changes from disease to disease. But clearly what I do can kill somebody and what somebody else do, does can kill me. We are all connected. You know, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elheinu Adonai Achad. God is one. There is one God. And that one God is all, we are made in that God's image. And that means all of us are a part of that one. And if we don't start seeing the world as one, that's bigger than me. And that's, if we can get that meaning of what makes us all one, what makes us united, what makes us connected, the names will come later. Finding teachers, finding people, keeping spiritual diaries. Some people find that helpful. Finding a time of day when you can take 10 minutes and just concentrate on what gives my life meaning? What am I connecting to today? Or where's the stumbling block? What's stopping me? What's annoying me? What's, 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 my, what's my obstacle, right? Putting things, guideposts, teachers, books, internet things, congregations in place to help us wrestle. And then just one last thing, and then, then I'll be quiet, is we're not meant to know God. We're meant to engage with God. And that's, that's an important difference. In the 60s, Rabbi Waskow talked about God wrestling. It's a powerful term, God wrestling. I will never know God. That's, that's above my pay grade. That's way, way, way above my pay grade. But what I can know is that there is a sacred entity that gives life meaning that I am to be engaged with. And so sometimes I'll believe, sometimes I'll doubt, sometimes I'll fight, sometimes I'll be angry, sometimes I'll rejoice, sometimes I'll be faithful. However, I enter into that relationship, 
But as long as I'm engaged, even as a doubter, as long as I'm engaged in that relationship, then God is a piece of my life. Rob, I start. Yes, ma'am. You're going to make me cry. That's really <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, that's what I believe. I believe there's one God, and that one God is love. And I think that that energy source, whatever it is, that you search for God. And that, sorry. No, no, take your time. Take a deep breath. You're allowed to be human. That you search for God, and it's not so much the name, but it's the connection. And that connection makes us better. And it's true, the COVID-19 coronavirus is horrible, but it's also raising a consciousness to understand we are all one, and it is love that keeps us together. So I thank you so much for being a guest and for what you shared. It's been and a privilege. Thank I you. wish you many, many blessings. Same to you. Thank you. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to share? I just hope people stay safe. I hope people come back to life incre incrementally and safely. And that if they are hit by death or illness, that they have the supports they need to survive and thrive again in the world. Yes, that's a beautiful thought. God bless you. And Same I'll to you. you. Shalom. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Rabbi Sonia Starr, I really enjoyed talking with her and I hope you enjoyed listening. We covered some really important topics today. We covered faith, we covered love, we covered prayer and honest prayer. We covered so much about human rights. I think love is a human right. I think freedom is a human right. And justice, divine justice, is a human right. Red Eye Star inspired me that I even went and signed up with the American Bar Association to help someone who has a sponsor in Maryland seeking asylum in the U.S. That's what community, conversation, and love do. I hope God and Matter inspires you in a similar way. Our next guest is Danita Neal. Danita is a world traveler and really interesting nurse turned attorney. Until then, thank you for listening to God and Matter. We are distributed through castbox.fm and available on YouTube. Arlie Speaks Media LLC produces God and Matter.